Hello, happy 2024. Uh, as you know, uh, I only record things when I have something I think that's worthwhile listening to. Otherwise, I don't record just blather on um, twice a week with recordings or whatever. I just don't have all that much information that, that that's worth listening to. This is going to be about an hour, and I don't know that that's that should even go on that long, but it is. It will because that's me. Sorry about that. But anyway, uh, interesting numbers, an uh, interesting window to look at, and that is um, regarding um, 2025 to 2032. Not that nothing is going to happen in 2024 necessarily, but I just think this window is very interesting. You have um, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, on September 23rd and 24th. 23rd is obviously the evening before 24th. Uh, it could be the 25th because we don't know the day or the hour, right? We don't know when the new moon, new moon is exactly when there will be a sighting. It could be 24th to 25th. Anyway, that's going to be Yom Teruah 2025. September 23, 24 will be the sighting going over into 25 because it's usually a two-day feast. The uh, feast of, or the day of atonement will be October about second. The evening before is about one, and uh, the day of atonement is going to be on the second. Because remember, on the Hebrew calendar, the uh, the days start at uh, sunset uh, the evening before. It's not like our the way we do things here, of course. So some interesting things. The middle uh, the middle of the week would be twenty twenty nine in March. Um, so that's some interesting stuff to look at, and and I have some some dates and things. I am going to put down below some helpful links that are uh, Torah calendar and Hebrew calendars, calculators, Hebrew calculators, time and date, um, measuring from one date to the next date, whatever dates you want, or if you can count by days and figure out what date it's going to land on. Very helpful. 2032. The um, Feast of Trumpets, or Yom Teruah, is going to be September 6th, 7th, somewhere around there. And uh, Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, is September 15th. Feast of Tabernacles is on the 20th. All of that in September of 2032. So anyway, uh, let's, let's get into this because um, to show you how I arrive at some of this, and there'll be a chart in here, so hang with it. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting into uh, a lot of the details on um, some of these things concerning feasts and proving the rapture and proving the tribulation seven years and so forth and the Hebrew wedding traditions. There are videos, lots of videos down below. If you click on the channel, scroll through and, and watch some of those. I'm not going to engage in, in argumentation and I'm not going to, I will probably delete if you're just if somebody just comes in to troll and tell me what an idiot I am and how there is no such thing as a rapture and I can't prove a seven-year tribulation. If you want to be educated and you want to learn, I'll probably engage. Otherwise, bye. I'll probably nuke it because there's plenty of videos down there. You can watch those and, and learn if you want to learn. If you've got honest questions, that's what I love. I, I love to discuss this. I could talk about this stuff all day long. And by the time you get to the end of this video, it might feel like all day long, so I apologize for that. Anyway, I'm going to put some links in there, and there's going to be a chart, and I, I hope you find it instructive. I'd like your comments. I'd like to know what you think, and uh, don't be disappointed. I'm not saying that nothing's going to In fact, there, there's good uh, reasoning for saying something could happen in Yom Teruah of 2024, not necessarily um, the way you think. <clears throat> so... From 2024 to 2025, there's some biblical stuff that you should know about. So hang on. Let's get in here and see. So I've got to get ahead. There's some presuppositions that I want to go over, though, and jump right in and take a look and uh, show you what I've found. So um, without further ado, um, pull this up because we're going to enter in with some presuppositions. Uh, and you say, great, Dave, what does that mean? Um, that is... That uh, one is that I don't think any of you will argue with me about and that is that the current calendars are flawed. Um, there are two or three Hebrew calendars and they disagree a little bit. There's the Gregorian calendar. Um, it's way off because we started off in the first century with one set of dates 
And then you had some Caesars who wanted to have their own vanity dates, months named after them, like Julius Caesar is July, Augustus it was uh, Caesar Augustus is August. So we so there's some names that got inserted in there and the dates got moved around. And then, um, you know, we had the Council of Nicaea meet. And, and then you had uh, the Roman Nundalo calendar um, was conflicting too much with the Julian and the Gregorian calendar. And, and they couldn't get them to mesh because a Nundalo calendar... Um, from Rome had eight days, eight days uh, of the week, you know, just like the Beatles song, eight days a week. <laughs> so they got in there and fixed that. And um, without any regard really to the Babylonian or the Hebrew calendars, um, they just, you know, westernized them and didn't pay any attention to the dates or the days of the week. And the days of the week did not mesh. So they just arbitrarily said, okay, well, let's just call, let's just call today Wednesday. Wednesday, does this sound good to everybody? Yes. Okay, Wednesday it is. So even the days of the week got messed up. So we're off by three days in the week um, from what the Council of uh, Nicaea did. And, and so now if, for instance, today's date, you know, everybody's looking at, um, you know, today is 20. 24, the start of 2024. In the first century, if you line the dates up correctly, we might really be in 2022, for instance. We might be in 2020. I don't know. We don't know exactly. Um, best guesses. There's some, you know, clues that people try to look at with, uh, you know, over history. Anyway, I'm not going to belabor all that. But the dates are pretty messed up. They're suspect at best. So when we... Some people, and I just say this because some people are trying to say, well, you know, um, creation would have been year zero going in the past. And, and you go up to this time here and it would change to this. And then, um, you know, the year Jesus died, it made sense that he would come in in the year 2000. It starts this new era. And he was about 30 when he was, you know, um, this happened. And so 2030, probably, or the year 30 is probably when he died on the cross and so this year would be you know and you can't do that math that way because we don't know how this year today lines up with a couple thousand years ago um so uh what we now recognize as the year 32 back in the first century might really be the year 30 back then we, we simply don't know so we take the cards that are dealt us and we do the best we can and we're just going to try to figure out the next handful of years and look at interesting windows and try to compensate that way. We also want to um, take a, a look at the Lord's feast days and the reason why um, is a couple of reasons. One is some of the pushback we'll get about how the Lord's feast days inform um, the life of Christ is because the Lord gave them to Moses. He, and the Lord said, these are my feast days and you will keep them forever and ever. So they aren't Jewish feast days. They aren't Hebrew feast days, whatever. Same thing. Um, they're the Lord's feast days. Why are they the Lord's feast days? Well, as we know, there's typology um, there's partial prophetic fulfillment in the Old Testament. All this stuff, the Lord in advance giving clues, advance notice, if you will, hints at the coming Messiah and what that would look like. And these seven particular feast days are the Lord giving us some strong hints about the nature of Messiah in his lifetime. And what he'll do from his um, first advent, when he was, came to earth born as a man, the son of God, and second advent, and that is when he returns. And, uh, you know, everything in between, I guess. So these events in the feast days kind of point to that. I'm going to see if I can pull this up here real quick. 
the chapter started off, the Lord spoke to Moses, and he's speaking to him about holy convocations or appointments, feasts. Um, and we'll get into the to the part of the reason why and, and how even this was forecast in advance. But the Sabbath was the first one. You know, you work six days on the seventh day, you rest. Okay, that's what the Lord did when he created. He worked six days, seventh day, he rested. Um, I'm, I'm going to pause right there briefly because... I want to make a note that the Sabbath is not just the sixth day of the week. There are a couple of high holy feast days throughout the year that will have a Passover, I mean a Sabbath day as well. For instance, when you get to Passover, um, Feast of Unleavened Bread, you'll have a, a high holy Sabbath day then too. So you can have um, Thursday and Saturday by our calendar, days of the week reckoning. Wednesday and Saturday, so you can have however it falls, you can have two Sabbaths in that week. And that's what would have happened during the crucifixion of Christ as well. A lot of people confuse that for hundreds of years, um, not really keeping up with uh, the uh, Hebrew traditions, Israelology, if you will, and understanding how to how to read the Bible. So that's a danger. We can read the Bible with Western eyes and we can be incorrect because we are not understanding the culture and what the Lord has done before in the Old Testament. Some preacher comes along, like Andy Stanley, and tries to tell you we need to unhitch from the Old Testament. Dead wrong. That's still the Word of God. And without the Old Testament and the, all the things, prophecy, prophecy is progressive. We learn as through the progress of time how things are supposed to uh, be fulfilled. And God, bit by bit, throws more and more information at us. And that's the way we learn. You know, you, you start off as a child, you learn how to count. You get a little bit older, you learn how to add up a couple of numbers together and then subtract them. And you get older and older, it gets more and more advanced. Prophecy is the same way. So don't ever listen to anybody saying, unhitch from the Old Testament. It's foolish. So we have we have this here. Let's back to this. I can go down rabbit trails, the drop of a hat, folks. Uh, so Passover would be the first one. We also have unleavened bread, first fruits, weeks, trumpets, atonement, booths. Okay. How did Jesus fulfill Passover? This is the easiest one we probably can all think of. You know, he's our Passover lamb. He died on the cross. His blood was shed for us. Just the same way the Passover during the Exodus, the blood was put, applied to the door on the sides and on the top, and making the sign of a cross, really. And whoever had the blood applied, um, the angel of death would pass over their house. They were covered under the blood so they wouldn't die. The firstborn of every family would not die. Okay, and then we have unleavened bread. Um, Jesus died without, uh, you know, uh, without sin. Um, he was without blot. Unleavened bread is, um, the leaven is yeast. So uh, that's why they have unleavened bread, because the yeast is representative. So often in the Old Testament, don't take my word for it. Um, look at all the, the passages, you know, this is, Bible Gateway. I'm, I like, I'm liking the ESV a lot these days. So this particular one I'm doing here today is ESV, but you can go up here. And instead of having the reference, you can type in, in in quotes to get both words in there, unleavened bread, or you can just type in the word unleavened, read the passages, and see how it's used and how it's applied. Feast of first fruits. Um, first, first fruits does not have to do with uh, order. Like first, second, third, fourth, first fruits has to do with preeminence first, a numero uno. Okay, he is the first fruits from among the dead. We are told, First um, Corinthians fifteen. Um, so he is the most significant of uh, all the resurrections. He was not the first one to raise, because he himself raised several in his lifetime before he ever went to the cross. But he is the first fruits from among the dead. Feast of Weeks, we also known as, we also know this as Pentecost. He promised the disciples he's going to leave, and he's got to leave, because until he leaves, this can't happen. I'm going to send you a, 
a comforter. I'm going to send you a paraclete. He'll come alongside you. He promised um, that we would receive the Spirit. Read this in, in John as well. So we get the promise of that. And then in the, in the book of Acts, what happens? But um, the Holy Spirit comes, uh, attended with miracles, there with the disciples, and uh, began in, in dwelling believers for the first time ever. In the past, there's been interaction with the Holy Spirit among certain of the prophets and so forth in the Old Testament and the judges. You know, what happened with Samson? He was clothed with the Holy Spirit and he, that with, you know, because of his long hair, he was honoring the Lord and so forth. The Lord uh, uh, put the Holy Spirit with him in a particular way there, you know, basically uh, like Superman. <laughs> you know, it's pretty incredible what he did for a specific purpose. But he was never uh, permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the kings weren't. Um, David wasn't. The Holy Spirit was there with them present very often, frequently. We know about Moses. Moses would go into a tabernacle or go into a tent and he'd uh, have this conversation with God, not the same as indwelling. So that happened. But that's all the first advent of Christ when he came the first time. So all that's done. And then he left, he ascended, and churches put together. A couple thousand years later, we still don't have trumpets. Now, some people will take these out of order and try to say trumpets. Um, trumpets is calling the people to attention. So the Lord did that, um, and they'll come up with all kinds of different dates when the Lord did that. Um, and then they'll say, uh, Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement is, you know, Jesus on the cross because it had to do with judgment. And and uh, they'll say Feast of Booths is, is God living with us. That's the birth of Christ. Jesus was probably born around the Feast of Booths, perhaps. So uh, that's about the, f the first coming of Christ. So they'll take these things kind of out of order. And these happen every year. Uh, it's possible Jesus was born during Feast of Booths. I don't know. Um, it probably wasn't December 25th. Little matters, really. And it hardly matters if we celebrate that or not. And we could celebrate it in May if we want. It doesn't matter. We're celebrating the first incar incarnation of our Savior um, let's celebrate it. Let's celebrate it every day. You know what? Let's do it every Sunday. It's Lord's Day, right? So we do it regularly anyway. We do it several times a year anyway. So so we can expect that Feast of Trumpets, Atonement, and Booths, um, Jesus, next time he comes, um, whether he comes in the air, we meet the Lord in the air, and also when he sets his foot down on the Mount of Olives and on his return, He's going to be fulfilling these things on those days. So, um, that said, uh, let's continue here. So, we have to anticipate that this pattern is probably going to continue, right? Jesus used various marriage and wedding analogies uh, when teaching about the kingdom. Thus, there are many upcoming events that continue this fulfillment. And I only say that because I am going to touch on one here um, in a bit, if you'll be patient. Um, I think it's very interesting. So I, I, what I want to do is, is um, again, draw your attention to the videos down below. If you're interested in knowing more about the Hebrew wedding traditions, there's some videos about that. Now that we've laid that groundwork, we can just blow through the rest of this. Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets, is as yet unfulfilled. Um, start at the first new moon, which marks off Tishri 1 in the seventh month. Trumpets is the feast that no man knows. So when Jesus was explaining to his disciples uh, some of the things in the end, and uh, he asked them, he asked the Lord, when are these things going to take place? And he says, um, you know, that no man knows the day or the hour, not the son, not the angels, but the father only. That's a double entendre uh, because it has application in the feast days, but also has applications in the Hebrew wedding tradition. In the wedding tradition, the way that worked was uh, when the bridegroom was betrothed, he would go away to the father's house, John 14. He'd go to the father's house and prepare a place for his bride. Um, and he'd be gone for um, roughly a year. And he'd be doing a room addition to the father's house, the, whether it's a, a 
on the same piece of property, but very often attached to the home like a big new addition. Uh, it's not like today where you go and rent an apartment or buy your own house or something like that. You have family property and the, the son would go and, and um, he would do a room addition. And as the tradition goes, he, the son, the bridegroom did not know when he was supposed to go get his bride. What he had to do is complete the room addition and he would go check with his father. And the father would go and uh, look at the room addition, make some suggestions perhaps. And uh, these suggestions might be some things that would require a little time to alter and whatever else, because the father is experienced and he knows what the woman probably is going to want in her in her home. So at the appointed time, the father would say to the bridegroom, after he's approved of the room additions, again, this is like John 14, where he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I'm going, I'm going to come and take you to myself. And um, so... I would suggest you go and read the first four verses of, of uh, John 14 for that. But he, the father would say, go take your bride. So then comes the taking. Um, where we, you know, it's the part of the tradition, really, the rapture of the harpazo. And the son, the bridegroom, would then get his wedding party together, including the best man, make a lot of noise, go through town, and go to pick up his bride. She knows it's been about a year. Time should be pretty close. Because it's like a game. They all kind of know. Anyway, they see the preparations going on back and forth across town. So a lot of times for good fun, they might about midnight um, go through town. All the townspeople are watching. They're excited. Uh, there's all kinds of noise being made. There's the blowing of the shofar. And they get over to the um, bride's home and the um, bridesmaids. The virgins have been watching, their lamps are lit, they're ready for the processional and their parties to merge. The bride has her trousseau ready, she's made herself white, she's gone through the purification process, the purifying baths and all that called the mikvah. Um, anyway, she goes through all this. And so what happens is, is the, the bridegroom and his party don't get all the way to the house. They don't open up the front gate, walk down the walkway and go to the front door and knock. He only makes it as far as the gate, so he makes it part way. She meets him part way, just like we meet the Lord in the air. He doesn't come all the way down to the earth. That's not yet. The second coming is technically when Jesus puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives. And there's a few things that happen right before that. So anyway, and then the two parties go and they go into the father's house. And there they have a week of celebration, feasting, and they're locked in there. Nobody in or out for one week, seven days, seven days. Does that sound familiar? Seven days, not three and a half days, not four days, not two days. Seven days, they're locked in the Father's house, and they celebrate. And then um, at the end of that, um, seven days of celebration and so forth, um, the doors are open. They step out. Um, behold, the bride, now wife, as we get in Revelation 21, She's presented and unveiled officially in front of the public. Everybody knows who it is and everything. Anyway, again, it's a lot like a game. It's fun. It's a formality. Um, she's presented. And then is the marriage supper of the Lamb, the actual marriage supper. Um, what that is, is it's more of a public one. Not everybody made it to the wedding or whatever, but this is one that's more for the town. So they open, throw the, fa the father's doors open. Everybody comes out. The guests come in. And they have this big marriage supper, and they celebrate that. So that all, there's a, a lot more details I'm leaving out, but that's that's the Reader's Digest condensed version. But the feast that no man knows with Feast of Trumpets also means, um, see all the other feast days all land on full moons. You can see that coming. And you know right when it's a full moon. The, the new moon for Tishri 1, or the Feast of Trumpets, is the time of year where you've had the autumnal equinox. What happens that time of year is on the horizon, you have got the moon kind of coming up right in the same place where the sun is going down, because that's the way everything lines up. So very likely on the first day, you'll miss, you'll miss it. So then you'll officially start 
and celebrate Tishri 1, Yom Teruah, on, on the second day, on the next day. So that's why it's a feast that no man knows. No man knows the day or the hour. You know the season, you know within a couple days. So it doesn't mean you'll never know. We might be a hundred years off. No, you know really close. You can see, you know, the moon is waning. It's going away. We're getting ready to start. And you know within a couple days when it's going to be. You have two witnesses go on top of the highest point, and they're watching. Um, once they have a sighting, um, word is sent down. They uh, certify the date, whatever, and it's, it will tell them when they're going to begin officially the, uh, the feast day. Feast day goes on for two weeks, two, two weeks, I'm sorry, two days of celebration anyway, over which time the shofar is blown um, in um, a couple, three different ways, three different ways, types of blasts. Um, the final one is the tekiah gadola, and it is the final blast, the hundredth trumpet blast of, of the shofar uh, over a two-day period. And it is the longest final blast. It's the last trumpet, the last trump. And that's where the term, the last trump, 1 Corinthians 15 comes from, is this final 100th trumpet blast on just this one feast day. It, it's like this, that you've got this thing called the last trump. The last trump or the last trumpet does not refer to the final trumpet um, judgment in Revelation. When Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 15, John had not written Revelation yet. Nobody knew about the, the seals, the trumpet, and the bowl blasts. That was unknown at the time. Um, so there were many hints and writings from the prophets concerning this, the day of the Lord and this time of judgment upon the earth. But uh, the details of Revelation weren't known then. Um, so the last trump is a, a very specific idiom, phrase, that, um, that the disciples would have known and those reading at the time would have known that would not associate it with trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation. And again, looking back at the wedding tradition, it's a seven-day time that the bride and bridegroom are locked into the father's house anyway, not three and a half days or some variation thereof, somewhere squishy in there, unknown. So, um, yeah, so it's not, it's not that. Let me see what else I've got here. Um, I've got, I got a lot of notes and I'm, I'm trying not to recover old, old ground from, um, you know, at, at too much length here, might be too late for that, right? So compare the last trumpet um, with, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and following, but also Revelation 4, 1 is a lot like the wedding procession that I just mentioned where they come. Um, the doors are open, the trumpet blast, the, the um, best man is there. In this case, John is the best man. Um, of the bridegroom and so forth. So it's it's all fascinating, and I urge you to read those passages and take a look at that because it's it um, it's really a blessing to read. It's well worthwhile. Okay, so Yom Kippur. Some people pronounce it Yom Kippur. Um, pick your poison. Anyway, it's the Day of Atonement. It's the most sacred day. This is the one we're familiar with, with the high priest going into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle blood on the, uh, well, actually, it's on the Ark of the Covenant. That's what the mercy seat is. Um, you know, and then you have that tradition of where they had put, a, you know, a rope around his ankle with a bell and if something happened. And this is not in the Bible, but it's a matter of tradition. And I guess they probably did that because what do you do when the high priest goes in if, he has not adequately um, sacrificed and covered for his own sins, and he goes in there and dies. Who's going to go in after him and get him, right? That's not going to work out too well. So anyway, that's that day when that happens. So Israel has been celebrating um, for a couple days. It's been celebrating the Feast of Trumpets, 
Um, and finally on Tishri 10, so you had the first day, Feast of Trumpets. Now on Tishri 10 is uh, another high holy Sabbath and uh, 25 uh, 25 hour fast, not hour, O U R, should be H O U R. Um, don't know what happened there. But anyway, um, there'd be not even any water, no food or water, because it's a time of, of great mourning over sin and recognizing your sin and contemplation before God, and you're confronted with your sin, or you should be. And um, so, what it is, is it completes 10 days of awe following trumpets. So uh, when you're celebrating this period here, you've got 10 days um, after Feast of Trumpets and Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. So you've got this period of days of awe. So that's kind of interesting, right? And uh, so there is prophetic application for judgment, the second coming, and the restoration for Israel, because after that, there's all kinds of celebration and so forth. It includes penitential prayers, Torah readings, blowing of the shofar again, not the same as uh, as um, Feast of Trumpets, but it's, it's still lots of blasts and things. Um, some great passages you should read, Zechariah 12, 10, or, you know, these are just some main ones, there's a bunch. Uh, John 19, 37, Revelation 1, 7, uh, well worth reading those. I'm not going to take the time now to do that because I'm going to be running long here anyway. I can tell because I also I know everybody wants to get to what you're talking about, Dave, with this whole rapture stuff coming up in this window. So let's do the last one here. Sukkot is tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Booths, um, huts, tents, dwellings. When the Egyptians fled, uh, Egyptians when, the, when Israel, when the Jews fled the Egyptians and went into the wilderness, they dwelt in, in tents, booths, but the Lord was with them. He preserved their clothing, he preserved their shoes, everything. Um, so what this is, is a recognition, it's a, a celebration of that, that God was with them um, during this time. It begins on uh, Tishri 15, and this one lasts for seven days. So Feast of Booths is a big deal. Um, it also is a Sabbath but you can carry some things, carry fire from one place and carry food and things like that, but you're not supposed to work. You're supposed to celebrate. You have open air um, meals and feasting and celebrating with others, and it's a great time of fellowship and so forth and celebrating the Lord. So you're celebrating the harvest, Israel's escape from slavery. There's much cooking out in the open, um, and it's a view toward the Messiah coming and tabernacling or dwelling with us, which is what will happen. Second coming, he'll come, he'll establish the kingdom, and he's going to be remaking the earth. He's going to have to because the place is going to be trashed after war and all the plagues and judgments and things on the earth. It's going to be a mess. So uh, it's going to be celebrating all that, that time where he comes, and it's the restoration of all things. Um, some great passages to read regarding that um, whole scenario is, uh, Joel 3, start with verse 17 and, and read a little bit. Uh, Zechariah 2, 10 and 11. Also take a look at John 14, 1 to 4. Um, and Revelation 21, 3. Those are some great passages. If you really want to read more about that, take a look at those. And you probably have some chain reference um, notations in your Bible. If you have a good study Bible, that might take you to some other verses in addition to that. And I would always encourage you to do that. Um, let me see what other, what other notes I've got here. Okay, to summarize. So, again, kind of, as the note says, we're back full circle to where this conversation started. And that is the, the Gregorian calendar solar the Babylonian and some some Eastern uh, Asian type calendars from back in the day were uh, lunar. So Babylonian and others are lunar. The Hebrews both it's lunar lunar solar. So the counting is solar. It's really is, strictly speaking it's solar. Yet the marking of months are with the new moons. Um, for example, Leviticus twenty three, the appointed days or the moads are marked with full moons, with the exception of Trumpets, it's the seventh month. 
Fishery ones, new moon. Okay, so why? Why is that? Um, Genesis 1, 14 and 15 says, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs, for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. It's so very cool. Um, that's the whole purpose why God gives us these things in the sky. He did not set the stars and things in the sky for us to uh, let the stars tell us what our future is going to be. Um, they're the Lord's signs and things he, he gives us. Um, and he establishes that. It's not have to do with, has nothing to do with. There's a difference between astronomy, which is, um, you know, looking at and admiring the stars and the heavens and, and the planets and so forth. And uh, astrology, which is believing that somehow the position of sun, moon, and stars, and planets uh, regulate your day. That's uh, strictly satanic. But that's what Satan is, right? He's a great counterfeiter. Close to the truth, but enough off to be just a big lie. So we are, therefore, uh, these lights are for recognizing signs, seasons, days, and years. However, we must recognize the flood shifted the rotation and probably angle of the earth. That's more stuff that affects our calendaring and how we count days. And I've got a reason for saying this. Um, in the flood chapter of Genesis, we can see um, a former 360-day year because of when they got in and they were in for so many days and then it, so it comes full circle. So we see a 360-day year and we say 30-day months. But then there's water vapor on the outside of the earth and it came in upon the earth, and there's this cataclysm that happened, and the crust shifted. The bowels of the deep were opened up, and that's where um, the crust of the earth in places collapsed in and created things like the Marianas Trench and all kinds of other things happened, and, and continents shifted, and so the water fell into the deep. And, and people sometimes will mock, you know, atheists, where did all the water go? You know, all those, this flood happened, and it covered even the highest mountains on the earth. Where did all the water go? Ha, ha, ha. Well says in the Psalms that God raised the mountains and lowered the valleys. Water finds the lowest point, right? So on the continents, we're like on mountains. And all the seven continents of the earth are like seven mountains. I'll just leave that right there. So as well, the shift between the Julian, Nundinal, and Gregorian calendars have made knowing the correct year and even the correct weekdays suspect at best. As a result, we don't know the correct correlation between the current dates and the first century dates. Uh, what was once the Sabbath now falls on Tuesday. So if you want to celebrate the Sabbath day on the same day that Jesus and the other Jews did in the first century, you'd have to do it on a Tuesday. I know it's going to mess up a lot of people who are like sacred name and Hebrew roots people and whatever else who think that they're following the law and following the Sabbath. You're not. Not unless you're following the Sabbath on a Tuesday because... You know, that got changed. Like I said, the Council of Nicaea messed that up. So, yeah, it's another Merry Christmas present for you that most people don't appreciate. I'm getting parched. Okay, so this is all interesting because um, in the time frame from 2025 to 2032, look at what goes on. We've got, we've got the way they corrected and adjusted is they've got some leap years. So we know that with our Western 365-day-a-year or 364.9 or whatever days a year, um, we've got leap years every four years. We can add an extra day in February. Um, in the Hebrew calendar, the way they do it is they've got a 19-year a period, and they've got like seven leap years in there or something like that, and it adds an extra month of Adar. Um, so they have a very specific formula. And so what that happens is, is in this time frame, this pocket that we have um, between 2025 and 2032, is we've got two leap years. So that kind of adds to some days. Um, so we'll show you what this looks like. But So five of the years coming from 2025 – Counting to 2032, five of those days or years, five of those years will have 1,772 days. 
two of them will have 768 days. So normally a year on the Hebrew calendar is 354.4 days, give or take half a day or whatever. It might change some things. Months will shift a little bit too. They go 29 day months, but some months might be um, 28 and, and so forth. So they, they might bounce back and forth, but it kind of averages out. So that's why you won't always, when you look at calendar things, like I've been making these notations and stuff, you don't always land necessarily right square on the day, dead top dead center, um, because they're a little bit, it's a little bit squishy. You know, though, if you get five, six, seven, ten days off the mark, like we did last year, it's like this is no go. We're too far outside of that pocket, too far outside of our window. The days just don't add up with how many days or months or whatever the Bible says a certain event's supposed to take place. Not so, though, with this period there from, um, you know, 2025 to 2032. So what we end up is, is you've got, if you go from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets, it comes out to exactly seven years, 2,540 days. The number comes up very often saying that, well, we should we need to be looking at 2,550 days and it works out just fine like that. If, if you've got a, a Feast of Trumpets rapture, for instance, and it begins the tribulation, then what ends up happening is 2,550 days later is the Day of Atonement in 2032. Day of Atonement, when you know, every eye will see him, people will weep and mourn. For their sins because they'll look upon him whom they've pierced and so forth. Day of Atonement 2032. That works out exactly. Interesting, isn't it? I think so. Because that didn't happen last year and it didn't happen in other years I'm looking at. But now here it happens. So let me get to this here. So, and in the middle would be 2029. Um, Nissan would be Passover, Passover week. Of 2029 would mark the middle of the seven year period. Okay, so here's some key indicators, some key things that you're watching for, timings that are going to be important for marking off uh, in the first half and in the second half of the tribulation week. Um, you have the two witnesses, they minister for 1,260 days, and we get that from Revelation 11. So from Tabernacles 2025 to March the month of Nisan, in that period there, really, um, in 2029, um, that would fit in there. And that's, is that when the witnesses are down, the the dragon comes and uh, basically Satan comes, possesses Antichrist and, and battles him and uh, kills them. But then three and a half days later, they resurrect and they ascend, right? And that would be right at a good time when... Um, you know, the Antichrist would come in and you'd, it'd kick off in the middle of the week is the Great Tribulation, the second half. Um, that's also when you'd see uh, the time frame for the woman, Israel, she's nursed for 1,260 days um, in the wilderness. The Lord divinely protects her. So that's also known as a time, times, and half a time, three and a half years from the middle to the end of Revelation, and that's in Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and verse 14. Then you got this beast system that's supposed to last for 42 months, and that's this entire second half. Everything is setting up, well, things are setting up for it now, but you really see it in um, the second half of the tribulation week, or the, or the great tribulation. And then you got you know, the 666 and all that happens from the middle. So that's supposed to happen for 42 months or three and a half years. And that fits in the in the end, the second half of the week. That's in Revelation 11, 2 and verse 13 also. Um, and so that would be from uh, Nisan and um, Yar, however you pronounce that month, to Elul uh, Tishri in the end. So in there, in that little, in that area depending on when the 666 inaugurated and all of that. But anyway, it all fits in there nicely with Second Coming Day of Atonement. Um, let me get the rest of this up here. 
trumpets. We all know about that already. We discussed it to death. Um, Tishri one for two days, for ten days of awe and repentance, atonement. It's Yom Kippur. It starts Tishri ten for one day, and it completes the ten days of awe. Tabernacles Sukkot is at uh, Tishri fifteen. It lasts for seven days. Here's the rest of it, and um, take a look at this and tell me what you think. But there's that beast system up there in the blue with the blue dotted line, and 1260 days. So 2029 um, of uh, Passover all the way to 2032 of Tabernacles. It fits nicely, uh, and then you've got that little pocket there give or take a couple of days in the middle for the two witnesses ministry wraps up and they're killed. And then Israel is fleeing and protected. Um, and they could go all the way up to atonement. So you got room for it to go up to atonement when there's a second coming and Christ steps down and um, swings through there to rescue them and so forth. Um, and you also have room in there for uh, assuming that, the Gog and Magog War. Um, by the time you get to Ezekiel 38, you could have the Gog and Magog War. The church could still be here. But there's a part in there where you get to verse 19 where once Gog and his armies encroach into Israel, headed down into to Jerusalem, it talks about his great anger and his wrath. Now, the church is not here during wrath. So up at least to that point, we could be here to see a lot of that. Look, look how long this nonsense with Gaza is going on. Well, it's not horribly long, but um, October, November, December, um, January, and depending on when you're watching this, um, wars tend to go quick, more quickly than they used to back in the day. You know, uh, uh, Vietnam War drags on for years. Korean War drags on for years. World War II, World War I. So contrast that with what's happened in Israel in the past. You had the Six Days War, and then in 1973, you had that war went, what was it, about 45 days or something like that? That was an awful one, but um, a relatively long day for Israel, uh, a long war, and they almost got wiped out then. So, but the Lord stepped in. Some miracles came out of that, some stories. So there's supposed to be seven years of um, burning fuel, 2,300 days in Daniel 8, 13, and 14. Um, when will that end? Sometime, don't know exactly when, but sometime before the um, inauguration of the kingdom. So Jesus comes back, and the kingdom doesn't start right away. He's going to be doing some restoration. There is the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. It gets announced, announced in Revelation chapter 19. He comes back. I mean, this is all announced by the angel saying, oh, guess what, guys? It's it's um, marriage supper time. And they're saying that before Jesus even comes on the white horse because they know they see it coming because he's on his way. So they're announcing it and they're praising the Lord for it. They're glorifying, saying, this is it, guys. This is it. This is the fiesta de resistance. This is when it all wraps up. And so he announced it. Jesus comes back. He will swing down through um, basically Moab and Edom and he rescues um, the people he has sequestered in probably Petra, divinely protecting them from all the missiles and things, right? That's not going to be Iron Dome stuff. That's going to be God Dome stuff. Uh, nobody will be able to harm them, so have them protected. Um, he moves through. He takes out his enemies there in Armageddon. Don't forget there's also the sheep and the goats judgment that happens. So those who are still alive, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. The goats um, uh, go into... Um, uh, outer darkness and the sheep get to enter into his kingdom. He says this is in Matthew 25, toward the end of Matthew 25, important to read. Um, and then you're going to have um, all this restoration stuff happening. He's going to first set his foot on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split north to south. Fresh healing, cleansing waters are going to pour forth uh, and start spreading really over the whole earth and start this whole restoration, regeneration process for the earth that's groaning uh, like a, a woman in labor um, waiting for delivery. So this is going to happen, and, and um, he's going to be restoring all this. And meanwhile, the table's being set, right? 
and um, he's going to raise uh, dead believers, um, and they're going to come and be the guests for the wedding, right? Because the marriage supper of the Lamb is the church, the bride of Christ. We're the one married to the Lamb. Old Testament saints and tribulation saints, for instance, um, they are not married to the Lamb. They're the uh, they're they're going to be uh, the wedding guests for this particular occasion. So they're invited. So it's going to be quite a feast time. And meanwhile, um, the kingdom is being set up. We also know that there's going to be Ezekiel's temple from Ezekiel chapter 40 all the way through 48. It's very, very um, detailed information about what that temple is going to look like and how set up, how the setup is. It's huge. It's massive. And so it, uh, we read in the scripture that Branch is the one who builds that, which is Messiah himself. He is going to build that temple. Um, he could make it be more, uh, built in an instant. I don't know how long he's going to take to build it or what his process is going to be. He could have created the earth in uh, microseconds, but he took six days. Who knows why? It's just the way he wanted to do things. So, you know, he's sovereign God. He does as he pleases. So he builds the temple. Somewhere in there is the inauguration of the millennium. All that to say is this burning of the weapons in, in Israel for seven years um, is going to terminate somewhere by, by the time you get into the inauguration of the kingdom because he's not going to need a bunch of stinky carbon footprint, black smoke, um, whatever burning of weapons into the kingdom. That's all going to wrap up by then. So you, you've got extra days that sometimes show up like in uh, Daniel chapter 12. You know, blessed is he who makes it to the 1,335th day. You're getting into now uh, Sukkot or, or later, depending on how you want to count that. And you've got to count backwards. And it's a little bit, you know, it's guesswork there. It's all just, uh, you know, you're, we're just presupposing a lot of things that may or may not be so as far as that goes, how the counting starts or whatever. But this window here is very interesting from 2025 to 2032. If you look at the bottom of this chart down here, leap years, it's this period we're in right now. So we're going to see this. We're in 2024. We're going to see a, a, a first and second Adar. And then also 2027, 2028, we're going to see the same kind of thing. So that makes the stretching of this time by days when, when you divide things up, it's, it makes it fit in nice and snug in that pocket there. So, um, but don't be dismayed. Everybody's looking for a rapture. I want the rapture to be this year. That's one of the first things my wife says is, no, we've got to wait another year because we kind of watch. It's a high watch time is Feast of Trumpets every year for us. You know, we feel like, we don't know, no, but we kind of feel like it's going to be Yom Teruah some year. And we look at this and she's going, no, we have to wait another year. Not necessarily. Not necessarily so. We should discuss the nature of Yom Teru or Tumpets. It's a call to attention for Israel. Now you could look at it this way. It could have application for us because that call to attention for Israel means the day of reckoning, the day of awe, the day of uh, atonement, this period, uh, the day of the Lord. It's coming. It's going to be a seven-year period. And it's going to get gradually worse and worse and worse. Um, so it's a call to attention for them. And we're taken out of the way because we're not supposed to be here for wrath. But does it all have to even happen in the same year? Not necessarily. We could have rapture for the church in 2024, but a call to attention for Israel in 2025. How? Deuteronomy 24.5. Catch this. When a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be liable for any other public duty. He shall be free at home one year to be happy with his wife whom he has taken. So you take a break. And it doesn't matter if you're a soldier. You're off for a year um, to be happy with your wife whom you've taken. Jesus could do the same thing. There's a reason why there's this stuff doesn't happen accidentally. So you have this here in Deuteronomy 24.5. Jesus could take his 
bride up, the bridegroom could take his bride up, us, the church, and be happy with us for a year. Yom Teruah to Yom Teruah. Then Yom Teruah next year can be the call to attention for Israel, and somewhere in that period begins um, this timeline as, uh, as we've been looking at. This one right here. So, possible? This is possible, folks. I'm speculating. I like to speculate because I like to watch. Uh, I, I think watching is what we should be doing. There's enough scripture that say we should be. Paul is looking. He's looking for a um, great appearing of his great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. First Peter, I want to say it's in chapter 1, talks about being watchers and watchmen on the wall and uh, how we're supposed to be doing this and, and how the prophets in the Old Testament were watching, watching and waiting for the Messiah. We're doing the same thing now. We're watching and waiting for the Messiah the second time. Uh, so anyway, that is... Um, the name of that tune. But take a look at this. Give me your thoughts. Give me your input. I'd like to know what you think. Um, look at the rest of the videos if you have questions about the feast days or if you have questions about the Hebrew wedding traditions. Take a look at some of the other videos. Hope, hopefully some of those topics you'll find interesting. Feel free to comment um, and share it. And um, please subscribe. Thanks much.